I want the system to be purely patient centric. I think our healthcare system has been designed not necessarily with how an individual experiences it, but but really more around legacy providers. And My guest today is Dr. Clifford Bluestein. Cliff is the global president and CEO of Apos Health. Today in the U.S., over 32 million U.S. adults suffer from osteoarthritis, the most common form of arthritis. OA is a degenerative joint disease or wear and tear arthritis. It occurs most frequently in the hands, hips, and knees. Cliff's company, Apos Health, has an innovative treatment that helps people with knee, lower back, and pain live well by improving their gait, all without surgery. I recently sat down with Cliff and we talked about Apple's health's approach to arthritis, the state of healthcare in the U.S., and how it can be improved. Cliff, thanks so much for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. Thank you very much. Good morning. Glad to be here. Okay, man, Cliff. Before we start, I'm just very curious because most people who become doctors, they know when they're like 10 years old that they want to become doctors. Was that your journey? You know, when I was in high school, I used to work for a health club. And when I was at the health club, I was fascinated by the bodybuilders who were able to lift hundreds of pounds, you know, on their shoulders and their chests and their legs. And, and I found uh, how the body works, the mechanics of that to be absolutely fascinating. And, and I was totally interested in learning more and more about how the body works and, and how a human could do uh, things that were kind of not even human. I mean, how do you lift 800 pounds and 900 pounds, a thousand pounds? It was just amazingly fascinating to me. And I wanted to learn more. What age were you? You know, I was in my teens then. I mean, listen, if you go back and, and you ask my parents, my parents said when I was growing up, I always wanted to be a doctor. And, and I think that that's, you know, sort of a natural progression. I think most people who go into medicine want to help others and, and are fascinated by the science and the ability to, to blend their curiosity uh, along with the ability to, uh, to help others. And I think that that's really sort of been my journey all along. Well, wow, nice. Very nice. You know, I've always said in high school, I knew these kids. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But the kids who wanted to go into medicine, they knew that since they were like four years old. And I, I, I envied them because they knew what they wanted to do with their life. I, you know, had no idea. And the kids who, who wanted to be in medicine, they had their whole everything planned out. It was just absolutely amazing. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, listen, the career of a physician is pretty prescribed, and I think you you know pretty early on uh, what you have to do to, to be successful between medical school, residency, and then ultimately in practice. All right, cool. Very cool. All right, man. So you are the CEO of Apple's Health, and I want to tell, uh, you've been at Apple's Health for how long now? Uh, almost five years. Almost five years. Okay. So folks, I want to talk to you about Apple's Health for just a minute and how I found Cliff. A friend of mine who I work out with, one of those guys who try to lift those heavy weights that you were so mesmerized with, I don't do that anymore, but I used to be able to uh, somewhat. Uh, I was having tremendous knee problems. And uh, a friend of mine, Dr. David Mendiel, who I work out with, uh, every week he looked at my knee and I said, Dave, what is it? He goes, go get an MRI. Go get an MRI. I don't, I'm not going to diagnose you here. And I got an MRI and basically it was no, it was osteoarthritis, which basically means define that for us, doctor. Yeah, I mean, arthritis is ultimately a deterioration that people have, you know, in, in their joint spaces and in their bones. And, and over time, you know, the things continue to progress uh, for some of the individuals. And it was, I mean, over two years, I, I was, it was painful, you know, it was bone on bone kind of thing. Uh, and I loved walking. I was able to walk eight to 10 miles a day without a problem. I have a dog. I'd walk with my dog. I'd walk just to think. Uh, in fact, before I do any type of uh, investment, I was usually wait a day and walk around the block several times to think. And here I was, I wasn't able to do any of this. So uh, I went to, got the MRI, went to a, a um, orthopedist. I wanted knee surgery. I wanted replacement. I said, I can't keep living like this. And he talked me out of it. Now, how common is 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 osteoarthritis i think you told me something in the millions of americans have it 
a big number? Yeah, you know, roughly 14 million Americans every year uh, visit a healthcare professional for knee osteoarthritis. And, and the actual number of people who, who have it beyond those that are visiting uh, uh, a professional are anywhere up to 6% of the total population. So it's a tremendous number of people that are impacted by this every single day. And, and the cost to the healthcare system is extraordinary. Just for knee OA alone, just associated with surgery, it's, it's roughly $32 billion in, in expenditures. Wow. How much is surgery, by the way, for one day he, about? He, yeah, for a commercial insurance product, it's about thirty-two thousand dollars. Thirty? Well, I guess not New York, because in New York, I think it's going to be. Well, in New York, more. New York, it's actually probably around sixty-five to seventy thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. So, one, someone recommended this doctor. I called up the doctor guy because I don't take insurance. You got to be crazy. I'm spending a fortune on healthcare, and you don't take insurance. So, next, so I went to this one doctor, and I'm sitting. There, he looks at the MRI, looks at everything, and he's talking me out of surgery. Why is that? Why is this? You know, I always like looked at it. A surgeon wants to operate. Why are, why, let me ask, let me rephrase it. Is knee surgery and osteoarthritis, is that such a complicated thing or just the process? Because he told me it was like six months of rehab and a whole bunch of complications that could come about. Well, the actual surgery itself is very well tested and proven. I mean, they have 10 year outcome data associated with it, but, you know, surgery is surgery. At the end of the day, there has associated complications. You know, if you look at both US data and UK data, anywhere from three to four people out of a thousand could potentially die from surgery. Roughly 30% of individuals can have uh, a complication that's not life threatening. It, it, uh, you know, there are some studies that demonstrate that at least 20 to 30% of the people that had knee surgery afterwards um, are not happy with the outcomes that they had. And, and there's a certain number of revisions that are required, estimated five to 6% of all surgeries on the knee every year are actually revisions. So people that have had a prior knee surgery that really need to have it done again. And, and so surgery is, is rough. It's, it's, you know, it's a major surgery and it does require rehab afterwards for people to regain their function. And, uh, you know, by the way, when I had this, when I first developed this like two years ago, I couldn't believe how many people 50 plus, 50 years old and up have knee problems or meniscus problems or I, I thought I was like, you know, these are people who must be in their 80s. But it, I, I just was fascinated how many, how many people it affects and impacts. Yeah, up to 45% of the individuals can have a uh, lifetime risk of ultimately getting osteoarthritis at some point. Uh, you know, it can impact, you know, musculoskeletal complaints. Uh, that actually impact people's lives, you know, uh, activities of daily living impact roughly 66 million people in the, in the U.S. alone. No, absolutely astounding. So anyway, I went to this orthopedist uh, and he basically convinced me not to do surgery. He said, you could still walk about a mile, a mile and a half a day. I said, I'm in tremendous pain every day, scale of one to 10, I'm a seven and it hurts us. And I couldn't live like this. I couldn't row anymore. I have a concept too. And I, I was rowing was a big part of uh, my, um, my exercise um, workout. Couldn't do that. Uh, it gave me drugs. Wasn't interested. Uh, go to therapy. I was going to sit there every day, go every week, go to therapy, wear a brace, all these things. So when it gets worse, come back to me. So Dr. Mendel said, try this Apos Health. And that's how I found you. Now, what I found so interesting is that the procedures that you folks have been doing for what, 20 years or so, 18 years? Yeah, we've been in business for, for more than 17 years. 17 years. It was so interesting that I said, I have to try it. And I speak here as a patient also, uh, fully disclosed. I just started the process uh, several, now it's already two months or so by the time you're hearing this. And um, I want to tell you, it's, it's, I, I was shocked. I was really skeptical. The pain went down and feeling a lot better. But before we get into that, I want you to just share with us, what is Apo's Health? Why is your thing such an innovative disruptor for the osteoarthritis industry, if you will? And the next thing we want to talk about is how come the health insurance companies are not covering this at this point? So let's start with the first thing. Tell me what this is. I, I guess I still don't know. So when people have um, osteoarthritis, you often get uh, a breakdown of two different parts of, of the body. The first is just the normal biomechanics of how somebody walks. And, and the other aspect is the neuromuscular apparatus. In English, you know, basically simply changing the way somebody walks 
can change everything. So when a person has pain um, from osteoarthritis, every time they walk, it hurts. And the body really overcompensates for that pain by bracing or, or creating a, a tension in the muscles around the joint to prevent it from, from moving further. And that just exacerbates the pain. So it creates this vicious cycle of you're walking, you have pain, your protective response is an overcompensation, and it just makes it all worse. So that people, very similar to what happened with you, slowly start doing less. So as you said, you, you're not doing the same activities that you used to do. And, and instead of running five miles, you start walking. And then instead of walking, you walk less. And so very soon within a period you know, of, of a couple of years, people who used to be incredibly active have actually stopped doing most of their activities. They, they've stopped doing life. And that's really what drives them ultimately to go to a doctor and to want to have some form of intervention. What Apple's Health does in simple terms is we're able to change your biomechanics to help you walk better. And by changing how your body interacts with the ground, we alleviate your pain. And then ultimately, uh, we're able to retrain your body's muscles and your brain so that when you take the device off, your body remembers how to walk again. Got it. So this device, let's be clear, it's a sneaker with plates underneath that you folks adjust. So I walked into your office. I walked about 20 some odd feet. You looked at, had sensors on my feet, seeing how I walked, my gait, the length of my stride, where it was. And I was in sad shape. I was like 70% of my time was spent on my right leg because I was favoring my left leg. And you're right, my back started hurting, my body started wilting. Uh, I started getting pain in other parts and it becomes very, the mental side is, it becomes very depressing. Yes, yeah, so uh, many people who have difficulty with their uh, locomotion or, or walking and, and have pain like you do, uh, many of them actually do develop depression. Many of them sort of withdraw uh, from all the activities that they used to do and like. And, and on top of that, many individuals also have a whole bunch of other medical conditions. So, and, and all of those start getting worse too. So if you have high blood pressure or diabetes, those things are all improved with more levels of activity. Right. And, and, and ultimately people develop weight gain, uh, depression, worse other chronic conditions. And, and that's one of the reasons why Apple's Health is so effective. We're, we're helping people to walk again. We're helping them right. to alleviate their pain complaints and, and improve their function. And I think that's really uh, what has driven the, the success of the company uh, in, in growing over the last several years. So it's a sneaker with you modify it on the bottom with certain plates that changed the way I walk. And I started walking. Why did I feel better almost immediately walking with this improvement to this sneaker? What, what was actually going on? Yeah, what we actually are doing is changing how your body interacts with the ground. So by changing the biomechanics, if you take a, a, a line from where your belly button is, which is roughly your center of mass, and you draw a line down to where your foot interacts with the ground, that creates forces that, that impact your knee. By moving where the pods are on the ground, we're changing where those force vectors are. And, and as a result of that, we are basically redistributing your weight at your knee level. And by redistributing your weight where your knee is, we're able to offload uh, the point of contact that's creating your pain. So once we, like uh, flipping a switch on a light, um, change the biomechanics so that the, you're, you've offloaded the pain, um, you're now able to walk without pain and your body's normal gait cycle returns. And we are able to then remember that new gait cycle by having pods that are convex. They have a small amount of imperceptible wobble uh, on the bottom of it, so that when you take them off, that wobbling really retrains your muscles in this new gait pattern and you're able to remember it. So just wearing the device uh, for up to an hour a day while you're doing your normal activities uh, really helps to retrain your muscles. It's getting all of the activity without the work. So, yeah, I've been finding that. So I'm worried, you know, started wearing it 10 minutes a day and after a week or so, 15 minutes and increasing to 25, 30 minutes a day. And I find out that the pain went down, but more importantly, I'm able to walk further distances 
with without an exaggerated gait or it, just going downstairs. Just going downstairs became more of a, a confidence builder for me because I was always scared my knee was going to buckle. And I've been hearing a lot of uh, people who had who have knee problems that now all of a sudden you start attracting these people because everyone has a story about knees and stuff, especially athletic people. And how one guy said, you know, I walk down only holding two banisters or I go on my butt. I go bumpity bumpity. Uh, that's how concerned it, it is. So I, I didn't realize what a big risk that was for falling and and just this until it happened to me. Yeah, I mean, Apos is FDA cleared for knee osteoarthritis uh, for temporary improvement in pain and function, which means, you know, we've been. We've, we've done the clinical trials to demonstrate the improvement in, in function. Uh, function you know, can be measured many ways. Uh, one is what you're talking about going up and down stairs. Others is walking more quickly. So we clinically measure velocity, which is how pa- fast a person walks. And, and we've been able to demonstrate time and time again an improvement in, in people's walking speed. But but. Equally important are patient reported outcome measures such as pain, stiffness, function, uh, as reported by individuals, just like you know, your reporting, Charles, is an, is an improvement in, in doing not only your daily activities, but some of the things that were really important to you, such as working out. You know, that's really a quality of life issue uh, above and beyond, uh, you know, the improvement in health that we're talking about. Right. Okay. Perfect. So now you... And Apos is like what you said, it was developed in Israel. They've been using that for years. It's in Europe as well. And the United States, is it covered by insurance in the United States? Yes, we have several insurance carriers that are covering Apos as we continue to grow and expand on a regional basis. So our business model basically grows into each of the states as we're able to secure additional uh, commercial carriers to cover us. Okay, my insurance for some reason doesn't cover it. And now I want you to take off your medical hat and uh, for the folks who don't know you, you are also a professor at NYU. Yes, as well. you have an Stern MBA. School of Business. Stern School of Business. So you you have an MD and an MBA. And I want you to 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 walk me through, and because I just don't understand this is every year, uh, my medical my my healthcare um, my healthcare church just ratches it up, fifteen percent, twenty percent, cost around a thing, but I really hit the crossroads when your product is four or $5,000, non-invasive, and they were pushing me without any problem. Without any problem, I got approved for, for knee surgery, which would have been meds, hospital stay, 60,000 plus, longer rehabilitation, physical therapy, which would have cost them a hell of a lot more. So my question to you is, Cliff, are more of these type of therapies that can circumvent, or just let me rephrase, delay surgery and big ticket problems and big ticket uh, issues are more therapies like yours and companies like yours. Is that finding more daylight in the, in healthcare? The answer is yes. I mean, uh, more companies like us are approaching insurance carriers for coverage or or benefits determination. And and, uh, we do get more insurance coverage, you know, day by day. I think the challenge insurance carriers have is that there are thousands of innovations uh, that they need to review and evaluate. And, you know, they want clinical trials that are uh, evidence-based research that demonstrate, you know, effectiveness of, of the product. And, and then there, you also need to have needs. So you have to be able to demonstrate that there's a need uh, and potential cost savings for the insurance carrier and in, in pushing this forward. So companies like us spend a tremendous amount of time, energy, effort uh, doing research to not only demonstrate its effectiveness in terms of the outcomes, but also to demonstrate the health economics research to demonstrate that we can save insurance carriers and employers money. So shouldn't they be, I don't don't know you know the right word, but fast track or what have you, something that uh, for many people who are not candidates for surgery, shouldn't this be something that they would, most insurance companies would be more than welcome to do and you're saving 60,000 plus and a whole bunch of other issues. And here you have something pretty low impact, four to $5,000. Shouldn't that be like front and center for them? If I was an insurance carrier and I could, I could get the research, I, I, gosh, I'm saving a fortune on this. Well, we, we certainly believe so. We've been able to demonstrate uh, 
time and time again that we can save insurance carriers money, uh, com combined both with actually decreasing the utilization of typical healthcare resources like uh, medication use, uh, visits to physical therapists, visits to orthopedic surgeons, visits to the emergency room, and, and separate and apart from that savings from either delaying or, or, or avoiding surgery. Ultimately, that's part of the economic value that you have to present to an insurance carrier in terms of saving them money. So we've been able to demonstrate to several of the insurance carriers that we can save them money, uh, both by decreasing the total cost of care, uh, as well as avoiding uh, uh, procedures that, that um, will save them money. I think, you know, we see it as a win, win, win. You know, one of the things that actually fulfills the quadruple aim, which is uh, improved patient outcomes uh, with both pain and function. We're able to save money for the insurance carriers and save money for the patients. And ultimately, we believe will have an impact on our population level uh, by helping, you know, you know, potentially thousands and thousands of patients uh, have a much better outcome for a, an area that has often struggled to find really good solutions. Yeah. So do you see this in your in the industry, in the healthcare industry? A lot of companies like yours who are innovators in this, uh, in this, in this, in any new area of of, uh, of of healing patients, where the cost is a fraction, uh, impact is pretty low. Is, is this a new? trend that I should be looking at as an investor? Absolutely. I think there are a lot of companies out there that can actually bend the cost curve and save money. And, and Apple's Health is certainly one of those that people should look to see, you know, how can you invest in, in solutions? I think there are there, one of the top three expenditures for employers is musculoskeletal pain complaints. And I think that there are a lot of uh, new entries into the market that are trying to tackle uh, that issue for, for employers and, and for payers. And, and we're one of them. And, and I think this market uh, and innovation is going to continue into the future. Future. You know, the number of total knee replacement surgeries right now is more than a million a year, and that's expected to grow at six to seven percent every year into the foreseeable future. Uh, and that's a combination of, of an aging uh, population in the U.S., uh, increasing obesity and, and other risk factors for knee osteoarthritis. And I think uh, because of that, it's a growing market. It's a growing problem. And there aren't a lot of great solutions out there. Yeah, I just see this trend uh, is, is tsunami-like because uh, you have 50-year-olds and up in this country, you have 118 million, so close to a third of the population is over 50 years old. And the younger cohort of, I think, the millennials, they're growing at a 4%. They're not even growing that much in terms of uh, population growth. But over the next five years, there are so many the older Americans where that cohort is becoming just bigger and bigger. We're living longer, and people aren't having kids <laughs> where – we were having them 50, 60 years ago. So as time goes on, it just seems to me a, a, a tremendous trend in terms of medicine and in terms of profit opportunity. Yeah, listen, you always want to invest in markets that are growing and the treatment of musculoskeletal conditions is going to grow. It's, it's that the population is getting older. Uh, the population is becoming less active. We are heavier than we've ever been before. And, and we know that osteoarthritis of the knee and other uh, conditions are going to continue to grow into the future. And, and we also know that, you know, much of the treatment for um, knee osteoarthritis in terms of what are approved by the guidelines is, is relatively poor options. You know, the more recent indications around knee injections is conditionally approved. Oh, one second, you know, one second. I had, those, I had the injections, did absolutely zero for me. And then I had cortisone and that I couldn't walk for like two to three days because my legs swelled up with the volume of liquid in there. And it did nothing. My wife, the, the gel worked. But for me, it did nothing. And the cortisone, I said, I don't want that anymore. So uh, those um, options sucked. They were just terrible. Yeah. And, and you know, clearly we have uh, an opioid epidemic in, in the U.S. Right. And, and you certainly don't want to be giving opioids for patients who have knee 
knee pain. So you're, you're left with really, you know, two ends of the spectrum, physical therapy and, and education, diet uh, to, to reduce your weight or surgery. And I think that that's where the opportunity for uh, Apple's Health comes in as another non-surgical, you know, completely safe option to, to try and help people walk again and get back to really their lives. You told me uh, when we were speaking about uh, some time ago last week when I was up in your office that back pain uh, has an enormous impact on the economy. You told me some numbers. I forgot what they were. What, were they, what was that? Yeah, roughly 47 million individuals uh, visit their health care provider for complaints of low back pain. An additional 300 plus thousand people have back surgery for chronic back pain. And, you know, the cost for, for just chronic back pain alone is at least another $66 billion. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. So I want you to take a 10,000 foot view for me because you're knowledgeable on both ends. You're knowledgeable from the perspective, perspective of running a company as a CEO, as well as uh, seeing the numbers behind it. If you could change one thing in the healthcare system, the way it's set up today in the United States, what would it be? I want the system to be purely patient centric. I think our healthcare system has been designed not necessarily with how an individual experiences it, but but really more around legacy providers and, and how they've historically delivered the care. If you look at almost every other industry, uh, for example, banking, you know, if you want to do your banking today, all you have to do is pick up your phone. You can do absolutely anything under the sun from deposit checks to transfer money, to do wire transfers, to do everything by flipping your thumb on the, the phone to, to interact in, in an extremely seamless way. I think when people are trying to experience healthcare today, it is not designed around how an individual would, would want to experience it. It's hard to get doctor appointments. It's hard to go to the office. Now you have to deal with insurance claims and co-pays and deductibles. It, 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 the customer experience aspect of it um, really has been kind of lacking. So Terrible. if I could change anything, I would love for all people within the healthcare environment to focus purely on, you know, how do we service the needs of, a, of an individual uh, the way they want to engage with the healthcare system. And that's certainly what we're doing in Apple's. We're trying to work towards being able to deliver our device, you know, where they want, how they want, when they want, uh, you know, from the comforts of their own home. And, and that's ultimately our goal is, is to be able to create a customer experience that's driven by how patients want to experience it. So why isn't the medical community being more adaptive to this? They, you know, you just can't hold back innovation. And we saw just an example that comes to mind is, Several years ago, when uh, former Mayor de Blasio wanted to keep out Uber uh, and, uh, you know, protect the taxi, uh, the taxi cabs in New York, uh, he tried, made it difficult, but the public just just pushed back on that, you know, not to have uh, Uber and Lyft and other ride sharing services. I still go to doctors and it's, it's, it's like nothing changed from 1975. You have to call up, you place a call. Okay, some of them do have apps now, do I got to say, you know, where you do a lot of this. But uh, to get medical information, it just is a, it's archaic. I think there are a lot of individuals that are out there trying to change that. I think you see there are a whole bunch of new entrants into the market, the, the Walmarts of the world, the Amazons of the world, the Targets of the world, all of these other new entrants to the market are trying to chip away at what was legacy healthcare providers. You know, if you look at vaccines today, most people get their vaccines at the pharmacy. Right, you're, right. you're not actually getting it at your primary care doctor or at your internal medicine. So I think that it, um, as new entrants continue to get into the marketplace, as people bring different ways of delivering care, I think that they're going to continue to chip away at what was the, the legacy providers or the historic way of doing things. And I think there are a lot of primary care groups that are trying to go all telemedicine and, and trying to create a very different experience for their consumers. I just think, you know, healthcare in, in nature or in general is very conservative. And because of that, they're 
uh, somewhat risk averse and, and somewhat nervous about changing the way things have been done because they know how things work, you know, the way they've always worked. So you know, a new way of treating somebody may or may not be better. They're not sure yet. Yeah, but just, you know, during COVID with uh, with uh, the televisits, that was a game changer where you would go to a doctor. I remember just going to a doctor, dermatologist and spending hours because they booked 47 people for the same half hour slot. Uh, you'd have to take it literally a half a day to literally four hours of my time for a 10 minute visit, which now can be done on Zoom and uh, or whatever, tell whatever they're using for that secure system. It seemed like they, it, the COVID pushed a lot of this innovation forward in a much rapid pace. Would you would you agree with that or? Well, there's no doubt that, you know, telemedicine usage went from less than 1% of all visits to at its peak, you know, roughly 60%. It's probably back down now to about 10% of all of the visits to telemedicine. So I think that there's clearly been a, a frame shift in how many people are thinking about uh, how healthcare can be delivered. And, and telemedicine is certainly one option to doing that. And I think everybody has sort of changed the way they're thinking about, you know, interactions with each other. Uh, having said that, you know, some visits have to be in person. And, and I think we, you know, at Apple's Health see uh, a mix. There are some patients that are very amenable to doing a uh, treatment in a telemedicine model. And there are other patients that ultimately uh, are very complex and challenging and they're better served being seen in, in a clinic. And then there's variations in between where you may want to see them in person for an initial clinical visit, and then you can follow up with them by telemedicine. So I think, you know, healthcare is learning or trying to learn, you know, what are the right patients to be seen in, in each of the different models. And to some extent, that's going to take some time to figure out. But we are always trying to push the envelope in, in innovation. And again, as you said, we care about patient experience and customer experience, uh, which is why you know 98% of all patients who try Apples are willing to refer it to a friend and family. And, and that's ultimately what we strive to do. You know, I think 10 years ago, uh, if you had uh, woke up in the middle of the night with a terrible stomach ache and go to the emergency room, you'd sit there for six hours. Now we have urgent care centers all over the place. Uh, you're right. Vaccines. You can now. You'd have to go to a doctor's office. You can go to Walgreens. Uh, you can get your vaccines there. So I guess you know it is changing, uh, but really, at a, I guess too slow a pace for those who want it quicker, and uh, and and too fast for those who uh, are really conservative and want to just make sure we don't screw it up. Yeah, and I think listen, it's all, it's all about balance, and I think that you know as as patients continue to demand more. I think that will speed up the the rate of change. You know, I think that that consumers have to be more active in in making their healthcare decisions than you know patients have historically been. And I think um, you know there've been many attempts to try and get better information to consumers, both around pricing transparency uh, as well as in terms of clinical outcomes uh, associated with the choices that they're making. I think you know healthcare is clearly more complex than than buying a car. But wouldn't it be really cool if we had the same type of information about outcomes and providers that we have, if you wanted to find out about any car that's made, you know, there are all sorts of reliable data sources that you can go to to get information. And I think, you know, transparency, which is being implemented now, uh, will, will help to improve that. Yeah, but I was reading some time ago in the Wall Street Journal that uh, hospitals that were supposed to be transparent based on this new law that was passed, were putting it on web pages that that search engines could not find. Uh, many of them did not do it because they felt it was a competitive disadvantage to let someone know what their surgery was. But for still a patient, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely staggering that I can't compare costs from hospital A to B to, to C. Why is that? It's hard. I think, listen, at the end of the day, uh, every hospital negotiates their own uh, reimbursement rates for all the different procedures that they're doing with uh, the different insurance carriers. And, and I think that it is a competitive marketplace uh, that's out there. You know, healthcare is still a business. Uh, sometimes people don't want to think of it that way, but uh, it is a business. And, you know, listen, yeah, but, the but, best but, way. But Cliff, why can't I compare as a consumer? So you're basically saying it's a business, but you're holding, you're, you're not disclosing to me information that can be to my benefit by making me a more informed consumer. How is that good business? 
I think that every consumer uh, would love to have tri- price transparency. I think what makes healthcare a little bit more complex is that unlike a car, um, where you, Charles, are going to go to the dealer and you're going to pay the money right out of your pocket to buy uh, the car. In healthcare, we have a third party payment system so that typically your insurance carrier is paying for whatever services you're receiving on your behalf. And you are only paying a fraction of the cost in out of pocket expenditures for the stuff that you're doing. So that it makes it a little bit more complex uh, to really understand and, and create that type of transparency. But if you look at Medicare, Medicare is publishing you know, rates that they're paying for most procedures across the board. And you can see how much surgeons are making for most procedures based upon Medicare. And you can get a pretty good guess as to what the pricing is based upon those, those fees. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's just that it's, it's one industry where it's still such a black hole for the consumer. I, I really know nothing about what goes on other than what's on the surface. Uh, you, it's, it's not, you, you can't, there's no paper trail. You get a, a bill at the end of a medical procedure, which is six figures that show the insurance company paid X. And I got a brace, a brace for my knee. It came out to $900 that I could have bought on Amazon for $64. I just don't get that. Listen, as I said, I think, you know, you asked me earlier, what would I change about healthcare? And from my perspective, it's how do you create a patient experience that is driven by what consumers ultimately want? You know, how do you deliver care where they want, how they want, when they want. And, and I think that that's ultimately what we're trying to do at Apple's Health. And, and that's ultimately what a better designed healthcare system is, is going to deliver. Yeah, I just hope uh, a quicker uh, they do this this quicker because uh, uh, aging population, hundred plus million people over fifty years old, and just getting older, and uh, the healthcare system uh, and, and the prices I pay for insurance are just I don't know, I want to talk about that. That's just uh, absolutely insane. Uh, I could have put a down payment on a house for the price that we're paying, and they keep going up quicker than the rate of inflation. Quicker than the rate of inflation. Inflation has no bearing on this. And we're going up in New York 15% or so for a couple of years, which is, uh, it's, it's staggering. And, uh, and uh, th- th- this is an industry that's ripe for innovative disruption, the way I see it. And it's There's no doubt. Happen. There's no doubt. I mean, healthcare, and, and that's one of the reasons why there is so much investment right now in, in all of these different types of innovations and technologies to disrupt the market the way it is. Listen, yeah. you're talking about... Um, an economy that makes up roughly 18 to 19 percent of the total GDP of the United States. Well, let's put that in dollars, right? That's four trillion dollars or so a year, twelve thousand five hundred dollars per every person, man, woman, and child in the United States. So four trillion dollars. Yeah, I'll put it. I'll put the number differently. Okay, our healthcare expenditure is larger than the entire economies of almost every country in the world, but probably around seven or eight. So in other words, we spend more on healthcare than almost every other country in the world does in terms of their entire economies. So there's no doubt we spend a tremendous amount of money on, on healthcare. And I think that, you know, the reason uh, why companies like us are, are trying to innovate is because we want to try and disrupt, you know, what is uh, traditionally uh, an area in musculoskeletal that costs a lot of money that, you know, needs some new innovations to be able to help drive the cost of care down and, and improve patient outcomes in a transparent way. Wow. Outstanding. Outstanding. All the power to you and, and Apos. Uh, as I said, I'm a, I'm a client, pa- patient, client. How is that? Where is am I referred to? How do you refer to it? You're a patient. Patient. So uh, it's still, you know, it started. We just started the process. You said it's about a year, uh, a year, uh, a journey on this. So so far, so good. I want to have you on in a year, a uh, year from now, and uh, I'm going to tell you how how it's going, and hopefully I'll see you before then. But but uh, it's it to me, this is what the semiconductor chip and technology was. 50, 60 years ago, how it innovated, disrupted a whole industry, healthcare industry with $4 trillion. There's just too much money there to not be disrupted in a big way. And there are going to be a few big players who are going to just go both feet in and, and 
It just keep, you know, just keep, the innovation just keeps picking up. And that's a great thing for everybody. Like you said, a win, win, win. I, I think so. Beautiful. Cliff, Dr. Cliff Bluestein, Appos Health. Folks, I'll put a link down in the description. Check them out. They have some nice videos. Look at the site. You could uh, check it out. There's some videos on it. And you see people, like I said, I'm using it so far so good. Everything's working. Uh, it, it, not that it, it really just putting on the shoes for me was, it's, it's, it's the hardest part is tying the laces. So, uh, it became a, a lot easier, but, uh, you know, companies like yours, I just, we just gotta have to really help not only stay in business, but really thrive because you guys are the tip of the spear as to attacking a $4 trillion industry, the way I see it. Thanks Charles. And, and remember you also failed everything else first. So yeah, you're, yeah. you're coming to us after you've tried everything else from injections to physical therapy to, to pain medication. So you're coming to us as a, as a typical patient, one who's already failed everything else. Oh, and yeah. who's really coming to us as sort of a last resort before surgery. So I think right. we're happy to hear that you're doing well so far. It's obviously expected that as you're, you're going to continue to improve since it's still relatively early on. And, and we're excited to, to be able to come on your show and talk about our company. Beautiful. Cliff, thanks so much for coming on the show. Uh, it, it was great. And uh, like I said, we'll have you on uh, 10 months or so from now, which will be a full year. And hopefully by then I'll be tap dancing. Sounds great. Looking forward to it. All right. Thanks so much, Cliff. Take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, We'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.